Okay, I hope you can hear me. I hope you can see me as well. Um, all right, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, tutorial on reservoir computing, uh, randomized recurrent neural network. Um, okay. Just to start, uh, a few information about me. Um, my name is Claudio Gallicchio. I am a researcher uh, here at the Department of Computer Science in the University of Pisa, as you can see from the background. Um, my research interests, uh, let's say, are um, at the intersection between uh, the areas of machine learning, deep learning, and dynamical systems. Um, in particular, I am um, involved in the development and uh, research in reservoir computing and deep randomized neural networks, especially. So um, I am involved also in a number of uh, IEEE task forces that are also related to the organization of this uh, tutorial, the task force on reservoir computing and the task force um, on randomization-based neural networks and learning systems. All right, um, let's start with the content of this, uh, of this tutorial. I, I will stop my video for the duration of the presentation. Um, just a quick, to leave space to the to, to, to slide, but just a quick note, if you, um, if you um, have a question at certain point, uh, feel free to interrupt me even by your microphone, okay? Uh, at certain points, you will see a green background. Uh, I will, uh, let's say, change topic, um, and perhaps I will wait a couple of minutes uh, to, uh, to look at the chat, okay? If you have any question or comments or anything to, to discuss about uh, what has been presented until then, okay? So I hope uh, this is clear. Thanks for coming. All right, so um, let's start with a brief outline of this uh, of this presentation. Um, first of all, uh, I'm going to try, let's say, um, to give a, a short introduction to recurrent neural networks. And uh, perhaps uh, you will be familiar with these concepts, but maybe it's, uh, in, it's on the one end, let's say, a, a way to uh, to to quickly recall some some important parts that I will use later. And on the other hand, it can be, let's say, perhaps a different perspective on a very well-known topic. Um, then I will discuss or motivate, let, let's say, the, the aspect related to randomization in deep neural networks um, and introduce the reservoir computing uh, paradigm. Finally, I'm going to try <clears throat> to, to give uh, a few information about uh, future, let's say, further developments of the field um, like, for example, uh, deep reservoir computing or uh, reservoir computing for graph data. <clears throat> okay, so let's start with a brief introduction to the uh, topic uh, of recurrent neural networks. All right. Um, so let's start with a, with a very brief motivation. Let, let's suppose that for our research, um, we have to predict the value of some specific entity. We do this all the time in machine learning and deep learning. Uh, let's say for the purposes of our example, this can be seen like uh, a point in a vector space. So we want to predict the next value of this point in a vector space. Okay, And this point in the vector space contains all the necessary variables uh, needed to describe a specific um, phenomenon of interest that, that we want to, to model. Mm -hmm. uh, this can be anything um, like, for example, a set of measurements from biosensors on a human being, or can be the evaluation of a movie, or let's say the position of a ball in the space, uh, a representation, multi-dimensional representation of a word in a sentence, um, whatever, okay? So let's suppose for the sake of this example that uh, we are tracking the position of a robot or uh, of a human, like in the slide, uh, in the three-dimensional space, we want to predict the next location of this person. Okay, so <clears throat> if we consider just this uh, atomic single position x, y um, in the space, uh, then um, the point is that it's really complicated to get a sense of uh, what's going on, okay, and where, uh, where the human will be in the next uh, time uh, instant. Okay, so where the, where will be what will be the location of the human, given only this instantaneous information on uh, where the human is now? Okay, um, so the point is that um, managing uh, just atomic pieces of information is not enough in many cases. In particular, in cases where what we are modeling is intrinsically temporal. Okay, like the trajectory of a person in the space. So. Um, 
there is the role of time and the role of causality uh, that become important okay to describe in a perfect in an appropriate way the information that needs to be considered for our learning problem all right um so in particular in, instead in, if i give you uh, um, an information about the previous positions uh, of this human then in practice um almost all of our uncertainty will disappear and uh, we can agree that the human will be probably in that position indicated by the, the blue um, the blue dot okay and i can give you a number of other examples to motivate the need to deal with causality and time for example in the uh, language processing uh, tasks like uh, predicting the next word giving the previous set of words like for example the sun is in the blank this of course we know it's sky but if i just give you only the the, the preceding word the then it becomes almost impossible to predict uh, accurately uh, which word will follow okay so if i give you only the then it becomes very difficult to understand uh, what word will be will be used okay um all right so and there are a number of other examples that, that i can give for example also related to music composition so uh, given the, pre the history of the previous notes played in the piano roll, then we can try to predict the next, um, let's say, column in the piano roll. But if I just give you uh, an instantaneous value of the, the single piano roll, that it becomes very difficult to predict the next value. OK, so in brief, we want to deal with the causality and uh, temporal aspect um, that we need to model in our, in our um, neural network system. Okay, so in practice, we are moving from what is represented here in the left part of this slide, um, what we can call one to one, um, let's say, um, problems or tasks where we have an input information X that is processed by our, let's say, machine learning algorithm or neural network architecture, and then we get an output value Y. Okay, so we want to extend this possibility like the one of image classification we know we can do this with dense layers or convolutional layers but we want to deal with something more general let's say okay so we want to deal also with this type of tasks like many to one where we have an input sequence and we want to get an output value one single output value and for example we uh, this is an, a typical example for sequence classification or sentiment analysis where we have an input an input sentence and we want to give a class for the polarity of the sentence. And then we can have other examples like sequence transduction, where we have uh, an input sequence um, for the system, for the model, and then we also have, uh, um, let's say, an isomorphic output sequence. So for every time step of the input, we have uh, one output. Okay. Uh, like, for example, video frame classification, human activity recognition, where for every time step, we want to know in every instant what the human is doing and then we have other examples like one to many like uh, the case of uh, image captioning where you have a, an atomic input uh, and let's say a sequential output like a description of the image that is given an input and finally also cases like many to many um, for machine translation where you have a, a multi-dimensional let's say um um, a multidimensional uh, and uh, um, sequential information and input of a certain length, and then you can uh, have an, an output, uh, another um, sequence of, of possibly different length. Okay, so the point is that we want to be able to model all, also all of these uh, variety of situations, not just the uh, situation in which we give an input, and based only on that input, we, uh, we achieve the output, we compute the output. Okay, all right. So um, let's go to our revisitation of fit forward neural networks. So why we want to extend the concept of fit forward neural networks? Uh, because in practice, there is no notion of sequence and causality in the computational, um, let's say, a fit forward neural network. Um, this is the case that uh, from, from which we started in the previous slide. And so in practice, we have an input information that is elaborated. Let, let's say it's um, it's uh, modified or purified somehow by the neural network layer, and then we get the output, okay? So in practice, what we do, we compute a transformation of the input X that is parameterized by a number of trainable parameters. Then after that, we apply, let's say, a nonlinear transformation and we get our output. 
But the point is that um, if we want to deal with temporal information um, and we have only uh, the, the ability to deal with atomic pieces, pieces of information, uh, then in practice, um, we the only thing that we can do is uh, handling time trivially, that is applying the same architecture uh, to the whole input series, one time step per time step. Okay, so in practice, we ignore the temporal dependencies. Mm? So we have an input x1, we elaborate x1, and we get y1. We do the same for x2, x3, and so on. Okay, um, but the point is that if uh, in the input time series we we add actually uh, a temporal uh, dimension involved, um, then it could be the case that um, I want that my um, output in the last time step depends also on the input a lot of time steps before that, okay? So let's suppose that to solve appropriately our task, we need that the output at time step five depends on the input uh, four time steps before, okay? And if we are dealing with time trivially, so we are um, applying the same neural network architecture that deals with atomic data, time step per time step, then this is impossible, okay? So there is no way we can deal with this. One thing that we can do, of course, uh, it's buffering or windowing the input, okay? So in practice, let's say when we want to compute the output for uh, the, the time step three, then what we do, we create a window around uh, the input x3, uh, let's, say of, um, let's say of length one around x3, and then let's say we, we, we give all of this information, x2, x3, x4, to the uh, layer, uh, the middle layer here that, that, let's say, computes the output for the time step three, okay? Um, but of course, there are, let's say, downsides, like I need to know in advance what is the, an, an, a sufficient length of, the, uh, of this window. And apart from this, we also uh, have um, typically over parameterization. So we, we increase the number of trainable parameters. Um, so the point is that it is difficult using this approach of buffering or windowing uh, to capture uh, the, um, the long extent structure of the of the temporal information because you can capture only short extent local structure um, in the in the time series uh, and uh, the outside and outside of the window the temporal dependencies uh, still are ignored. Okay. Um, so this is the approach of uh, one-dimensional convolutions uh, for temporal data. Uh, this is the approach of time delay neural networks, etc. Okay, um, which are useful, of course, but they don't uh, appropriately deal with the temporal dimension of the data. Okay, so what we need to do, we need to introduce a state in our uh, in our network, and uh, let's say we we introduce, let's say, in a sort in a sense, a number of connections here. Uh, what we do in practice uh, in, in the green layer indicated in the, in, the, in the left part of the slide, what we do is we create a representation of the information uh, that has been uh, given in input to that layer. Okay, so we create a representation of the information and encoding information, okay? Um, so we introduce this memory cell state indicated by the letter H such that when we give an input to the system X1, we create this representation H1, and based on that, we create the output uh, Y1. But at the next time step, when we give an input X2, we have an input also uh, H1. So we, we, we know a representation of the previous part of the, uh, of the, of the time series. Okay, um, so in practice, um, um, this information of the memory state is passed across time uh, from time step uh, to time step. And uh, in this way, so we have the output that depends on the current input and also on the prior history of the, of the, uh, of the input. Uh, the point in any case is that if I want that now the output at the last time step uh, depends also on the input a lot of time steps before, then now I have a computational path in my uh, architecture that allows this. Okay, well, previously I didn't have it. Okay, so uh, coming back to the description of the neural network, uh, now we, what we do, we introduce in practice um, feedback or recurrent connections around uh, the hidden layer. This is the uh, peculiar characterization of recurrent neural networks. Um, so um, this idea of introducing a state uh, makes the computation based on a couple of equations. One equation computes the state. Um, that describes the evolution of this memory cellar state, 
Okay, so this is a, a recurrent relation applied at every time step uh, used to process the time, the temporal uh, sequence. Okay, um, and so in practice, we compute the state as a function parameterized by a number of parameters w of the input at the current time step and the state in the previous time step. Okay, and uh, using this uh, state information, we can create, we can compute the output. This depends on the specific problem that we want to solve. But let's say that in general, based on this information on the state at the time step t, we can create or we can compute the output at time step t, so yt. And when we come to the equations, more in, let's say in a practical, form we can see that we have this at least th these two type of equations so when we when we deal with recurrent neural networks at least in the most basic version we need to deal with these two types of equations a state update equation that is computed by this layer here the recurrent layer or cell um, and then output function that is computed by the output layer also called readout layer okay so in practice these equations for the state update tells us that the state ht is computed as a function, let's say a, a, li a linear combination of the input and the previous state modulated by, um, let's say, a couple of weight matrices an input weight matrix and the recurrent weight matrix um, and passed after uh, a, um, a hyperbolic tangent nonlinearity. The same way, the output, let's say, in the most simple form is computed like a linear combination of the state modulated by a weight matrix for the output, so output weight matrix. And now we come to um, the aspect of, let's say, um, computation of uh, this kind of um, performed through this kind of, uh, of architecture. So in practice, in, in this slide, uh, on the left part, we have, let's say, the uh, atomic building block of uh, a recurrent neural network. Um, and when we feed this neural network with a temporal series, what we do, we in practice replicate the same architecture at every time step. Okay, so uh, the, the um, in practice, the parameters of the transformations stays the same, of course. Uh, what changes is the information that, that is processed. Okay, So when we unroll this uh, recurrent architecture, this one, uh, across time, we get this unfolding network. Okay, And the point is that this unfolding network is actually very similar when, it, when we look at that uh, on the temporal data. It's very similar to a deep neural network. Okay, So we have a uh, um, a sequence um, uh, of multiple um, nonlinear layers, one after the other. Okay, they transform the information from the beginning, in this case, from the initial time step of the time series to the last time step of the time series. And so, as we are uh, processing the information through this very deep, potentially arbitrarily deep architecture, what we have to pay attention to is um, the concept of stability. Okay, so stability of the computation performed by a recurrent neural network becomes um, crucial in both in the phases of the of the forward computation and in the phases of back propagation. Okay, in the phase of the forward computation, um, the problem that we can have is the one of fading or exploding memory. What does this mean? It means that uh, when we have, let's say, fading memory, when we give uh, an input, let's say, at the beginning of the time series, as we are processing um, let's say through a lot of nonlinear transformations, this information through the layers in this, let's say, purple pathway across the architecture, then it is possible that this information is shrinked and shrinked and progressively shrinked uh, across the steps. And in practice, when we are in the last time step, suppose that this is a classification problem, in the last time step, we end up with an information that is completely lost. Okay, so this is the, let's say, or broadly speaking, the, the characterization of the um, fading memory. Uh, on the contrary, we could have exploding memory in the case of an unstable dynamical system computed by this green part. What does this mean? It, it means that it perhaps we have, let's say, a, a tiny perturbation at a certain point in the, in the input. And then uh, this means that a lot of time steps later, this in, the influence of that tiny perturbation has, explode, has exploded. So in practice, um, what does it mean? Uh, it means that the system is unstable and tiny perturbation in the input can determine arbitrarily um, different uh, in states uh, of, of the system. Okay, so this, this is, of course, undesirable for generalization 
in, um, in this type of architectures. Okay, so this is a, a, an important problem. Um, and it is really very similar to the problem of gradient propagation uh, that perhaps is more, uh, let's say, known in the literature and more discussed in the literature um, because uh, of, the, of the problem of trainability of, of uh, recurrent neural networks architectures. But the point is exactly the same. So in this case, what we have, uh, instead of having the input information that is propagated through the layers, we have the loss information that travels the architectures uh, backwards from the last time step all the way to the first time step. And in practice, we have a similar situation where the, uh, let's say the discredent information gets multiplied by small numbers or very large numbers. And then we can have instabilities in the way in which this information is propagated. Okay, so for today, we're going to deal most of the time with this problem of the forward computation, but this is in practice the same as uh, the, the problem of backpropagation through time. Okay, so how to approach uh, how to try to solve these these types of um, of problems? Um, in practice, in literature, the most known way is uh, to use gated architectures. What does this mean? It means that we try to solve the problem of uh, instabilities of uh, information uh, propagation uh, architecturally. So we we want to create a pathway for uninterrupted gradient propagation. Um, in a sense, we are making the architecture uh, a little bit more complex, or let's say uh, um, decisively more complex, in order to overcome the limitation of the information passing. Mm -hmm. um, this is the case of the famous uh, long short term memory networks and gated recurrent units. These are, let's say, um, nowadays supposed to be the state of the art in, in modeling uh, sequential data. Um, or another, another possibility that is the one that we are going to, to, to see in detail in this tutorial is related to the smart initialization. And in practice, instead of making, let's say the things more complicated using the gated architectures, uh, what we can do, we can exploit actually the biases, the architectural biases of the recurrent neural networks in order to do, um, let's say a computation that is uh, as good as possible. Mm -hmm. So limit the problems uh, of, um, let's say, information uh, loss or explosion by a, a proper smart initialization of the recurrent neural network. Okay, and before um, going into the details of uh, uh, reservoir computing and randomized based uh, architectures, um, just let's let, let's briefly see uh, what I mean by making the architecture more complicated. Okay, so this is a depiction, a famous depiction of a long short term memory cell, where you can see in practice this part uh, computes the standard computation of a, of a conventional vanilla recurrent neural network layer. Um, so we what we are adding is all of these extra components in the network. So the gates. Right, so I'm not going into details. Uh, perhaps you're already very familiar with that. Uh, we have these, let's say, nonlinearities and pointwise multiplication with the forgate gate, the input gate, and the output gate. And this, in practice, on the one end, allows the gradient computation flow without interruptions from the from um, let's say arbitrary points in times backwards, um, but also makes the computations um, more heavy in a sense. Okay, so compared to uh, so when we want to look to uh, when we will, when we want to look at the long short term memory equations, um, let's say uh, we have let's say this first line that is uh, the same uh, as in the case of an ERC neural networks. Okay, but then what we do we add all of these extra uh, equations, so all of this extra computation, with also a lot of extra parameters to be trained to be trained on the input data. Okay, so in a sense, we are adding a lot of complexity to our system. And the end, what we see is that training is much slower. Okay, so when we when we want to train a long short term memory network uh, compared to the training of a recurrent neural network, then the training uh, is more computational intensive. Okay, um, so this can be this can be of course. Um, this can be, of course, fine, but the point is that uh, let's say we we could perhaps there are situations where we um, don't need uh, all these let's say um, extra computation in order to uh, appropriately solve our task. Okay, so we we want to find also alternatives 
to this to this uh, possibility of using long short term memory networks. Okay. Um, so this leads me to the um, concept uh, of randomization in deep neural networks that I would like also to use, like a, uh, let's say a proxy to motivate further the the, the need for alternatives uh, to a more complicated neural networks architecture. In a moment. Okay, so the point is that um, we know deep learning um, achieved, a, let's say, a tremendous success over the years. Um, but uh, one of the downsides is that uh, this um, comes um, typically at the cost of, um, let's say, high cost in terms of uh, both times, uh, training times or inference times sometimes, and um, parameters, okay, trainable uh, parameters. Um, okay. So in practice, now it's very easy, for example, in TensorFlow or PyTorch to, to deploy uh, and train a deep neural network um, with the level of accuracy that you desire. Okay, so you create a, typically a over-parameterized deep neural network, you train on your data set, um, and in practice, you can get the, the accuracy that you want. But the point is that there are situations in, in which the accuracy perhaps is not the only constraint that you might have, and you might have uh, also other constraints in terms of time and efficiency, okay? So constraints in terms of time and trainable parameters. Um, exactly the cost that you need to pay to train your deep neural network model, okay? So now I'm, I'm speaking more in general, not necessarily recurrent neural networks, deep learning in general. So the point that I want to pose is the following. Do we really need a fully trainable, so all the complexity of a fully trainable deep neural networks even in the cases in which we have all of these extra constraints, that is not just an accuracy constraint, in, in which case I want to reach the highest accuracy possible, but also, let's say, um, constraints in terms of computation that needs to be performed faster, and also resources that I can use for the computation. So suppose, for example, you don't have any GPU, you don't have any uh, high performance computing support. So for example, you are doing machine learning at the edge, um, and you have, let's say, a very um, cheap platform that you need to use, okay, for your deployment. Um, okay, so in these cases, do we really uh, care even for a decimal, a decimal point in the accuracy, or let's say um, a point in the accuracy if this comes uh, at a very high computational uh, cost in terms of, of resources demand? And so typically the answer is not, and there are a number of situations in which you, um, you might prefer, let's say, a lower level of accuracy, but let's say a um, more flexible approach that can be used also on, on embedded uh, devices. Okay, so for embedded applications, for example, you you have you can have a situations related to autonomous driving, or you can have a situation in which you uh, have let's say sensors on the human and you want to perform human state monitoring, for example. Um, so in all these situations, your computation needs to be performed on a very small uh, device, possibly very close to where the data is produced, also for privacy reasons, because you are managing uh, sen sensible human information. Um, and so you, for example, you don't have GPUs to speed up your training algorithms. Okay. So for example, nowadays, um, for, for instance, TensorFlow with TensorFlow Lite allows you to, to deploy the, the neural networks for uh, for the inference part, also on these kind of devices, very, 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 um, very uh, low resource devices, but um, sometimes, almost every time, you need also to personalize the the services that you're giving to the user. Okay, based on the user, so you want to also do the training on the uh, on the uh, on the board. Okay, so in practice, you need to find alternatives to complicated training algorithms. You need to find alternatives to have efficient training algorithms. Okay. Um, and this, of course, is not the case of back propagation through time. So we need to find alternatives. Um, and again, this is related to the point that deep neural networks nowadays are, are usually over-parameterized and over-complex. And the point that is that if we focus only on the accuracy, okay, um, not just uh, for, let's say, the type of application that you need to, to, to face, perhaps you are really unable to, to reach that level of accuracy, but there are also some ethical 
and uh, economical and environmental uh, social costs, let's say, um, that you 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 uh, might need to pay in order to reach that level of accuracy, and perhaps it's not the case. Mm -hmm. So. Um, all of these important aspects have been recently disseminated in this paper uh, that is called Green AI, where Green AI means research that is more friendly from the environmental point of view, and um, as opposed uh, to uh, red AI, which means expensive, unfriendly from the environmental point of view. Okay, um, and so the point is that when we uh, when we do training with the deep neural network, or let's say a deep recurrent neural network. Uh, we are actually um, consuming a lot of, let's say, energy in practice. And it, it's important and interesting to quantify also the carbon emissions of machine learning in this direction. So for example, when you're going to submit your next work in AI, perhaps you could have a look at, at this nice website, um, Machine Learning Emissions Calculator, in, in which you can indicate the type of hardware that you used, how long, Etc. So for your experiments, you can compare also the different um, the different uh, algorithms based on the on the on the um, uh, let's say um, carbon emission carbon footprint of the algorithm itself. Okay. So this this calculator gives an estimate of the uh, kilograms of CO2 that 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 were required uh, to run your experiments, and I think this is also important. Okay, and in practice, we, okay, energy consumption matters. Consumption matter. This is uh, what, what I wanted to say, um, and um, yeah, because uh, after all, if we if we work in AI, if we work in machine learning, perhaps we want to do something good for the humankind, humanity. But in practice, we we are ending up in destroying the planet in doing so. So. Um, there are a number of studies that tries to calculate, uh, similarly to the previous um, website, the um, carbon footprint of uh, training uh, complex um, AI systems. And uh, okay, so apart from the for, for, from the um, um, environmental um, incidents of this, it's also uh, there, there is also let's, let's say a, a social barrier, an economical barrier that perhaps you cannot uh, cross. Uh, and perhaps this cuts you off the, the research um, community, and this is not nice, okay? So perhaps you are so much inside of this problem that you can even, uh, it's possible that you don't even recognize them and perhaps conclude the abstract with this uh, information like something like, it's unfortunate that one is only $1.2 million in order to do the compute, okay? So uh, if you don't have $1.2 to, uh, $1 million to do the compute, perhaps you can never compare with some parts of the research. And I think this is quite unfair. So of course, uh, this, uh, this is an abstract that is perhaps quite famous uh, uh, and perhaps quite unfortunate. I, I'm pretty sure that the authors modified that after, after um, a few days. In any case, um, just to conclude this, this part of, um, let's say, motivation to the need of cheaper training algorithms, there is also this nice paper that I suggest uh, that is called the Hardware Lottery by Sarah Hooker that, let's say, describes um, situations in which a research idea uh, is successful or becomes successful over the years because uh, it is suitable to the available software and hardware, okay? So perhaps you had a very good idea, but th that idea didn't match the hardware that, that, that is, let's say, um, commercialized at the moment. Like perhaps try to, to do computation with sparse matrices in, in, in TensorFlow or PyTorch, then you can have a, a good sense of what I'm saying, okay? So this is a way to say that um, the, the typical resort to uh, backpropagation and backpropagation through time, so gradient descent algorithms that is, let's say, suitable for the current um, level of development of deep learning nowadays um, can bias our research into several fashions. So there are social barriers, economical barriers, uh, a tremendous carbon footprint, uh, perhaps uh, the impossibility to do the learning on, on small devices and also the bias to, to the researchers, okay? So perhaps you, you're, you are not going to be successful with your, with your algorithm because, um, let's say, run on TensorFlow or PyTorch, the training times are not as good uh, as the super optimized, uh, for example, uh, algorithms that, that uh, come uh, in, the, in the literature, okay? 
So um, this is uh, just to motivate the point. And now to get more into the detail, um, to start, let's say, scratching the point is that um, now we, we try to see deep learning, at least at broad, broad level, like a composition of two aspects, uh, architectural biases, so the properties of the uh, of computation that de derived from the um, architecture, okay, uh, and uh, learning algorithms, okay. So when uh, when when we deal with deep randomized neural networks, what we do, we try to uh, eliminate from this equation the learning algorithms, and we try to focus as much as possible only on the architectural biases, and we try to see uh, how far we can go, okay. Uh, reducing as much as possible the the um, the application of the of the training algorithms and so in practice in practice what we have in brief what we have is a sort of complexity accuracy trade-off where we start uh, by the linear models like linear regressions uh, linear classifiers uh, with low complexity uh, and you can train them in split second but they also have a very limited accuracy because the linear modeling uh, assumption uh, could not be helpful um, to model for example nonlinear phenomena then we have something like uh, super vector machines uh, or let's say um, in general classical machine learning techniques okay these may have higher complexity but also reach more um, more uh, higher levels of accuracy so today we have of course deep neural networks which are on the other edge of the spectrum compared to linear models uh, that are featured by a huge amount of complexity but can reach also very high high level of uh, accuracy um, state of the, of the art results in a, in a huge number of cognitive related tasks. Um, and um, when we think of deep randomized neural networks, let's say uh, the same architecture of the deep neural network, but with, um, let's say, learning applied only to a part of the architecture, let's say, um, then we are in here in the plot, in, in, the green, in the green position, in the green box. So the idea is that uh, using this kind of algorithms, uh, the complexity of the training uh, is just a little bit more than the, than that of linear models, but the level of the accuracy is comparable, let's say slightly below the one of deep neural networks with full training, uh, because we try to avoid as, let's say, as, as much as possible the, 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 the use of training algorithms, but we exploit as much as possible the properties of the computation given by the deep uh, composition of the, of the layers in the architecture. Okay. Um, the philosophy for the approach comes from this very well-known quote by Rahimi and Racht. Um, uh, the, the quote is, randomization is computationally cheaper than optimization. And that's also a nice, uh, in, intriguing, let's say, mathematical features that you can, let's say, uh, have a look uh, at the paper. At, at, let's say it's a strand of works uh, at NIRIPS um, around the year 2007, 2008, 2009. And in practice for this paper in 2007, they won the Test of Time Award um, 10 years later, 2017, uh, in a very famous, um, in a very famous uh, talk. Uh, Rahimi uh, is also, let's say, describing this, this approach. Um, so uh, the, the, the aspect that I'm going to, to convey through all of this tutorial is that randomization in practice means efficiency under several uh, points of view. Okay, in particular, um, and let's say uh, straightforwardly, because training algorithms are cheaper and simpler. Um, for example, also from the point of view of model transfer, you don't need to transmit all the weights. For example, if you have a randomized layer inside of your uh, trainable architecture, um, then when you want to transmit that specific layer, you don't need to transmit all the, let's say, quadratic number of um, weights of numbers you just need to transmit the uh, the random seed that generated that that layer uh, but also intriguingly um, randomization also is amenable to neuromorphic implementation so neuromorphic implementation the alternative to von neumann let's say where you put the computation and the memory together like for example in photonics um, or in memoristic devices um, well the point is that you in order to have learning in every layer you need to comp to, to create a complicated circuit or a complicated, let's say, a photonic system. Um, and uh, instead, you can exploit the, the natural properties of some physical substrates uh, in order to do the computation uh, without learning. So let's say limiting as much as possible the computation to the forward pass instead of the, of the backward pass. 
Okay. A description of the model can be given broadly, uh, let's say, from the perspective of randomization in, in deep neural networks in this slide, where we can see that our system is computing the information by modifying the input through this hidden representation layer that computes, a, um, let's say, um, representation function fr of the of the input, and this this is followed by a, a readout function. Okay, so the readout function computes a function g. And so the output overall is a composition of the output function and a representation function. Um, the, the crucial point is that the inner of these transformations, the uh, representation function is fixed after initialization and you only apply learning to the readout layer, so the output function. So suppose in practice that um, uh, you, you have a generic function approximation task where we want to denote by x the input vector, okay? Um, and by f of x, the model uh, on the left-hand side, uh, the model that we want to train, okay? So we compute this function by linearly combining a number of randomized uh, features. Uh, so a number of, you have a number of functions, uh, h of x, that computes this, uh, this transformation. So you have a capital H um, number of, this, of these functions. Um, Okay, and then you combine these, uh, let's say, randomized features, or let's say, randomized transformations of the input uh, with these beta i's coefficients, okay? That, that are the only trainable coefficients that you have in this equation, okay? Um, I said these uh, functions, um, h of i, are, let's say, randomized functions that can, can come, uh, let's say, in the form of a sigmoid basis expansion with random coefficients indicated in the, in the, in the green boxes. Okay, so this is a very elementary kind of model. Okay, so it's, let's say, a, a nonlinear tra randomized transformation followed by a, a linear combination of these random features that is trainable. Mm -hmm. So this elementary kind of model has been proposed in several forms and popularized under several names uh, in, the, in the literature, uh, like, for example, uh, random vector functional links, random kitchen sinks, ex extreme learning machines, no, pro no propagation algorithm, stochastic configuration, um, networks, etc. Okay, so the essential things, um, the essential thing in common um, that, that these, uh, all of these models have is that the inner projection is randomized, the outer projection is learned. Um, and learning is quite easy because let's say it becomes a simple linear regression that you have in the output layer. So consider that you have a data set of couples x, i, y, i, so what you do, you collect the feature expansions um, HI into the rows of a, of a matrix, let's say, uh, big H, and then you can find the solution of the L2 regularized uh, least squares problem. So the problem that we have is to find, let's say, the argument that minimizes this, this quantity. Um, and a very simple way to do that is using a ridge regression where you can introduce this, uh, let's say, Tikhonov regularizer lambda in the equation. Okay, so very simple and really amenable to a lot of nice properties like uh, optimal federation, etc. cetera. Um, there is in uh, IGCNN a specific tutorial on uh, randomization in, in machine learning, but there, I also would like to, to suggest uh, if you are interested in broadly speaking into this topic, to have a look at my uh, tutorial um, in, the, in the last uh, AAAI conference. You, you can have, let's say, a look at the, the tutorial website in the bottom of this slide, so you can go on my website and, and look for that. Um, and also, I would like to suggest, uh, let's say, as a reading, this book chapter that I recently published with my with my colleague Simone Scatapane from the University of Rome. So this is a book chapter, but it's also available uh, on, on archive. Okay, all, all of this information is also available on the tutorial website. Okay. So this motivates the need to do a learning in a, in a different way also for recurrent neural networks and reservoir computing, um, which I'm going to, to, to describe in a, in a few moments. Okay. So in, in, an alternative to training with, for example, vanilla recurrent neural networks or long short-term memory networks, the, um, 
the uh, dynamical recurrent neural networks is actually out there and is called aggressive wall computing. And this approach focuses, let's say, on a major distinctive characterization. It is uh, the, uh, the, let's say, to decouple the treatment of the recurrent layer from that one of the output layer. Okay. So in, instead, uh, in a sense, to uh, training blindly by, by bad propagation through time, uh, the recurrent dynamics of the system, what we try to do is we try to focus uh, on the dynamics of the system uh, under the lens of dynamical system theory. Okay, so in practice, we, we try to look at the, at the properties of the recurrent layer under the dynamical system theory perspective. Um, okay, so this said, uh, we have again the architecture of a recurrent neural network like before, where we have, let's say, a recurrent layer um, that in, is called reservoir in this case. Um, and uh, this reservoir is followed in the, in the uh, architecture by uh, a linear readout, okay? So a readout layer, the output layer is typically a, a, a dense layer of linear, uni uh, of linear units. Mm -hmm. um, okay, um, so in practice, similarly to what I, I, I said in the previous part of the tutorial where, where, where I was dealing with uh, deep randomized neural networks, um, when we look at the equation that is performed computed by the reservoir, it's this one. Um, we have a number of parameters here, these two matrices. And in practice, instead of applying learning to these two matrices, uh, what we do, we use randomized weights, okay? So we uh, initialize randomly these weight matrices, but um, under stability conditions of the dynamical system. Okay, um, what does it mean? Um, it, it means that we want to impose, we, like I said previously, we want to study uh, the properties of this uh, layer, of this reservoir layer uh, as a dynamical system. And actually, um, typically we can consider this layer like a, a non-linear, non uh, discrete time and non-autonomous dynamical system uh, on, on which we want to uh, impose stable dynamics. Okay, so in literature, this, let's say this condition, uh, this property is typically called the echo state property. Okay. Um, all right, so in practice, uh, what we want to find is a way how to initialize these matrices in order to ensure or somehow um, guarantee at least uh, empirically uh, that the system will have stable dynamics. After that, we are done. So instead of doing all the complicated process of training, um, or introducing, uh, let's say, more complicated architectures, what we can do is just uh, smartly initialize the reservoir layer in order to be stable, and let's say, use that in order to perform the computation mm -hmm. with a number of interesting properties that we're trying to, to look at in, in this tutorial. Okay. All right, so this is the, the, the general picture of reservoir computing. So focus on the dynamical system and decouple the treatment of the recurrent layer from that one of the output layer. Mm -hmm. um, so the recurrent layer is a dynamical system and, and is studied as so. Um, the approach in any case has been proposed under several names and by different groups, more or less um, in the same time frame, like uh, at the beginning of the 2000s, uh, so 2001, 2002. Uh, from different perspectives. So I think this is really cool. The same idea has been disseminated uh, under several perspectives uh, independently and uh, in a sense from um, originating from different uh, points of view. One of the most uh, famous one is the Ecostate Network. Um, it has been proposed by Herbert Jage and uh, collaborators. Um, okay, the idea was proposed in 2001, but the most famous paper is this one on science. Uh, in practice, uh, we are using, in this case, hyperbolic tangent uh, nonlinearities in the neurons and discrete times computation, like those that I am using uh, throughout all of this tutorial. But there are other, other approaches like liquid state machines by uh, Wolfgang Maas and collaborators from uh, the University, the Technical University of Graz. Um, in this case, in practice, we have a similar approach. Um, but instead of, let's say, uh, having the reservoir, what we have is, a is the so-called liquid neurons, 
uh, that is a layer of spiking neurons. So this comes from the area of computational neuroscience. Um, and then there is this other work by Peter Tinio uh, and collaborators uh, called Fractal Prediction Machine um, that is perhaps a, a little bit less popular, but still in the same framework and uh, originates from the study of contractive uh, iterated function systems, so a fractal theory in this case. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, let's see a little bit more in detail. Uh, what, what uh, I mean, how can we describe um, the, the computation performed by the reservoir computing system in the case of the ECOSTEP efforts. Okay, so we said that we decouple the, the treatment and the analysis of the two components of the system. We, we decouple the treatment of the reservoir and the analysis of the reservoir from that one of the readout. Okay, so focusing on the reservoir, in practice, what we have, we have a, a state evolution system. So we have an equation, a state update equation. Um, such that the state at time step t is a function, like we said, of the input xt at the current time step and the state in the previous time step. Okay. There are a number of typical characterization of this uh, hidden recurrent layer. First of all, this is typically larger than um, a conventional recurrent layers that you can see in applications. Like in this case, we can have large layers. Okay, so hundreds or even thousands of neurons. Uh, the second point is that uh, to cope, let's say, to, to recover from the, uh, from the aspect of having large layers, we uh, have typically sparsely, um, sparse connectivity between these the units in the reservoir. So that we can potentially, at least we can use um, sparse, matrix, sparse matrix multiplications in order to speed up the computations. Um, so it's not uncommon that you see 10% of uh, connectivity inside of these uh, inside of these type of architectures, and this means really very sparse architectures. Um, the two typical aspects, though, is that uh, the reservoir layer is randomly initialized under, let's say, what we are going to see is the echo state property, so under a stability condition, and is left untrained after the initialization. So, if you want to look at the at the property, so what, what is computationally that the reservoir is doing? Actually, what, what, what it's doing is um, embedding non-linearly the input into a higher dimensional feature space, okay? So this is exactly in line with the covers theorem. So we know that if we do this in practice, the original problem will be more likely solved linearly in the reservoir space in this case, okay? So this is one of the biggest motivations of reservoir computing. Um, uh, let's say you can see this also like a randomized, randomized basis expansion computed by a pool of randomized filters, okay, uh, that aims at providing a, a, a rich, let's say, a diverse set of input-driven dynamics. And based on these input-driven dynamics, you can compute the output or classify the time series, for example, uh, more easily, okay. Um, all right. And then we have the, the readout on top, of the, on the, on top of the reservoir. So the readout in the most simple formulation is just a linear combination of the uh, elements in the state, okay? Um, and uh, as, we, as we are supposing that we are not going to apply any form of learning in the, in the reservoir, then it, this means that uh, if we apply offline learning, at least in this case, uh, we can do the training in closed form. Okay, even perhaps online, but let's say uh, in, in closed form solutions now are amenable. Okay, and this is a big plus um, of our, of our uh, approach because there are a number of properties like the uniqueness of the solution. But let's say this is the, the, the distinctive dif difference with respect to, to typical uh, recurrent neural network setup. Okay, so um, yeah, you can see, for example, a pseudo in inverse uh, algorithm. Um, and the basic idea of the computation that is performed by the readout is that uh, it uses the features in the reservoir space, let's say, for doing the output computation. Uh, typically, it is implemented by using linear models. Uh, so this involves convex optimization with, let's say, a number of properties that you can use. And in practice, in any case, you can use all the outcomes from the linear literature. So you can use LASSO, for example, to introduce regularization, but no, I mean, this is quite flexible. You can even use um, a dense layer that is trained using uh, 
let's say a state of the art optimization algorithm that you can find on Keras or PyTorch. Okay. Um, it's just that in, in literature, typically uh, this becomes amenable to convex uh, optimization, which is typically not the case for fully trainable uh, architectures. Okay, um, I think uh, it's past one hour now, so uh, we can have a five minutes break and come back uh, in five minutes to continue with the properties and the, uh, let's say, perhaps a little bit more of information about the way in which reservoir computing works and what we can do with that. Okay, so we can start, um, we can continue, we can start again our, our tutorial after the break. Um, so we um, just briefly illustrated the properties, let's say the architectural components of a reservoir computing system. Okay, so the reservoir is the recurrent hidden layer that is untrainable and is uh, initialized uh, under stability conditions, and then the output layer is the uh, readout that is trainable and is typically a linear layer, so it can be trained, for example, uh, using convex optimization. Okay. So the crucial part in practice is the reservoir initialization. Okay, so uh, the, like I said, the reservoir is randomized. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the crucial point is not just the fact that it is randomized. The crucial point is the fact that as a dynamical system, uh, it, it needs to be stable. Okay, so what we want is in practice that the state information uh, carries uh, the information about the input, um, but is not too sensitive, let's say, to little tiny perturbation of the input. So we want the system, uh, when the system receives a similar, let's say, input information, it needs to create a representation that it's similar. If we have, let's say, on the other hand, an unstable system, it means that if a certain point in time, the input is slightly perturbed, then the state will be completely different. And this is not okay, of course, for generalization purposes, okay? So in, in practice, uh, we want a state that is, uh, let's say, a, a state transfor transformation function that is random but stable in practice. Um, Okay, how to do that? Uh, let's say try, trying to do the, the, the theoretical uh, story quite short. One very simple thing that one we can do is we can control the maximum singular values of our recurrent weight matrix. Okay, so this WHH is the recurrent weight matrix. Um, in practice, if this is true, then our system implements a contractive system, is a contraction. Um, and so we know that in practice, after a, a, a transient, the, the, the state, all the input information will fade away. Uh, so in practice, this is uh, typically too restrictive in, in practical applications. And what we typically do, instead of controlling the maximum singular value, we control the spectral radius of the recurrent weight matrix. Okay, so we, we control the, the eigenvalues of the, of the recurrent weight matrix in order for them to be smaller than one. Okay, so this is um, this is called the necessary condition for the echo state property, while the one on the maximum singular values is typically called the uh, sufficient conditions, sufficient condition for the echo state property. So of course, the necessary condition of the echo state property under specific, let's say, assumptions, um, doesn't mean that if this condition is true, then the system is stable for every input that you're going to give to it, to, to, to the reservoir, and even for your specific input that you're giving. But let's say this is a good, let's say a good uh, way of scaling the recurrent weight matrix. So in a sense, this is a hyperparameter that you introduce in the design of the system, and the, that typically it's scaled to a value that is smaller than one. Okay. So this condition almost always in practice ensures stability of the, of the reservoir dynamical system. Um, so um, let's say how to, how to, uh, how to do that, um, how to scale the spectral radius properly. Um, there are a couple of ways, okay? There is a, let's say naive way of doing this is the number one here in this, in this slide. You can generate a random matrix, okay? Let's say initially the matrix is random then I rescale its spectral radius because I know that the spectral radius is a linear operator. Okay, so I can generate a matrix randomly. Then I can, 
sorry, uh, I can uh, compute the spectral values of this random matrix. Then I can normalize with respect to that and then multiply uh, with the spectral radius that I want. Mm -hmm. um, but this can be, let's say, quite time consuming if you have a very large uh, uh, recurrent weight matrix. So if you have a very large reservoir layer, uh, because you have to compute the spectral radius, or, or at least you need to find a, an efficient way of computing the, the, the eigenvalues or the largest, at least, uh, of, of that metric. So this can be time consuming. Perhaps more, uh, it's available another way, perhaps more smarter way to, uh, a smarter way to do that. It's generating, let's say, using, let's say, the, the intuition from a random matrix theory, and in particular the circular law, you can find, let's say, um, uh, uh, in advance the the um, uh, from which distribution you want you want to let's say um, uh, pick the, the weights the random weights of your system of your uh, recurrent weight matrix in order to have that specific uh, spectral radius of your generated uh, matrix so in practice what i'm saying is that you can generate a random matrix from a uniform distribution where you properly choose the values uh, of the extremes of this uh, uh, uniform distribution. Okay, so for example, in this case, if I want a spectral radius of rho in my in my recurrent weight matrix uh, of uh, of sides n, then this is the these are the two let's say extremes of my uniform distribution from which I have to pick my weights. Okay, so in practice, okay, sorry for the misplacement of this of this uh, circle here. So in practice, we treat this rho value like a hyperparameter of our system, the crucial hyperparameter of our system. OK, so you can have uh, a look, uh, if you want, at, at, at the details on how to do this in this uh, paper, fast spectral radius initialization uh, for recurrent neural networks that I published with my colleagues uh, a few years ago. OK, so um, when it comes to stability, uh, why, why do we care a lot about stability? And what does this mean in practice? OK. So in practice, it means that my system is, in a sense, robust to tiny perturbations or to, or to equivalently to um, um, initial state conditions. Mm -hmm. So in practice, suppose that I have three different um, starting points for, for my dynamical system, okay? Or let's say initial conditions for the recurrent hidden layer, uh, H0, Z0, V0, okay? So suppose that now I drive the, the reservoir with the same time series. What, what, what changes is the starting point, okay? And then what we, what we end up with in the case in which we have stable dynamics is that the, all the orbits of my dynamical system, in this case, it, it is, let's say for, for simplicity, it's just one dimensional, okay? Um, all the orbits or the possible orbits, uh, if I start from the yellow point for, for, from the green point or, for, or from the red point, all of the orbits will synchronize after a transient. Okay, So in a sense, my system uh, now is locked to, um, let's say, uh, an attractor um, that is, let's say, a orbit. Okay? And this, um, let's say, appears after a transient. So now my, my computation uh, in a sense, is an echo of the input. So the, the state trajectory is an echo only of the input, mm? uh, not of, let's say, initial conditions on the state, and does not depend too much on uh, tiny perturbations in the, in the, uh, in the injected input. Okay? Uh, on the contrary, uh, unstable dynamics means, in practice, that the, all the, 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 in this case, the three orbits are really sensitive uh, to the initial conditions or equivalently to tiny perturbations. Um, so in practice, what does it mean? It means that even if I start, okay, even if I drive the system with the same time series, if I start with the three different initial conditions, or if I give three arbitrary um, input perturbations to my system at a certain point, then I end up with, let's say, um, uh, with, with time series and with orbits that will never synchronize, okay? So in practice, this is really not good for generalization uh, because in practice, the, the encoding of the time series will really depend too much on the initial condition of the recurrent hidden layer or on tiny perturbations that I can have in the input. Okay, and uh, a natural question that we can have is, uh, why does this approach of ecostat networks works in practice? 
Um, and I can try to give you an intuition that is based on one of my papers uh, published in neural networks. Um, so in, in practice, the answer is that uh, what we are doing when we uh, use, let's say, um, um, a stable system to encode the input, what we're doing is we are using, let's say, um, the suffix-based Markovian bias uh, of the state space organization, okay, of that is intrinsic uh, to recurrent neural networks dynamics. Okay, so let, let, let's let's see this more more in, in detail. Um, this is a let's say um, an intuitive let's say graphic representation in the paper. You can have also uh, more the sense of the numerical things. But the point, just to give the the intuition, is the following. Uh, suppose that I have uh, a number of time series, okay? And suppose that I want to classify this time series. Mm -hmm. And this time series, uh, again, for simplicity, we uh, have only a couple of symbols mm -hmm, that can um, that can appear in the time series uh, just A and B, okay? So the time series is a time series uh, of uh, elements that are only A or B. Um, okay. Um, so what happens? Uh, suppose that I have a system that is, let's say, a, a contraction. Okay, the re my, my reservoir is a contraction, uh, based on the, let's say, the, the overview over the theory that I that I showed you previously. Um, so now what happens? Um, in practice, if the system is a contraction, then you can see mathematically that um, it, it's going to organize the state space uh, in a, in a sense in a fractal way. Okay, in a base that is based on the suffix. Mm -hmm. um, this is so-called suffix-based Markovian organization of the state space. Okay, so here on the left we have the input in this light. On the right we have uh, we have the state space. Mm -hmm. So let me use the laser pointer here. So here we have the input. On the right we have the state space. Mm -hmm. So the, the representations of the input. Okay. So we look at the first two, two sequences. They share a common suffix, for example, of length two. And so they are mapped into two very uh, similar points into this um, state space, okay? Um, look at these other two uh, the time series. They, they, they have the same suffix, AB in this case. And so they are mapped into very close points into this uh, state space. Mm. So now the point is that the state space is where the learning takes actually place, mm? the only place where the learning takes place, mm? because we are doing le learning only on the readout layer. And this state space is the input space for the le learner, okay, for, for the readout in our case. Okay, so in practice, what happens is that, for example, if I have to solve uh, a classification task that is in line with this suffix based organization. So the last part of the input time series is more important for the classification. Like for example, in this, in this example, um, these two sample, these two sequences are positive, these other two are negatives. Uh, then it's very simple for me to find, uh, let's say a hyperplane in this state space where I can separate the positive and the negative samples. <clears throat> So the operation of the reservoir is in line with the properties of the task. But what happens on the other hand, if I have, let's say, a, a, a situation that is different. So my, in a sense, my, um, my task is not in line with this uh, Markovian organization of the state space. So for example, this is negative, this is positive, this is negative, this is positive. Then now it becomes a little, um, let's say, a lot more complicated um, for the for the linear regressor or the linear classifier to solve the problem appropriately, okay. So this is to say that why and when, in a sense, reservoir computing works properly and smoothly is in cases in which um, the target is in line with this uh, induced Markovian-based organization of the state space, okay. Um, and in practice. Um, this might sound like, a, um, let's say, a limitation, but uh, there are a lot of problems in which you can successfully use uh, this approach. And this is a principled approach because, you know, you, what you are using is actually a property of iterated function systems of, uh, let's say, recurrent dynamics under the, let's say, the constraint of um, contractivity 
Okay, so in practice, this is just to say that even before learning the recurrent connections, um, a recurrent neural networks has already some computational properties. And these computational properties are given by this way in which it transforms the input information into the state, um, given this suffix based uh, organization of the state space. Mm -hmm. So even before learning, even with even without learning at all, the state space is organized in this way. Okay, you don't need to learn this kind of organization of the state space because it is given for granted. Okay, it's given intrinsically uh, by the initialization. And you can use it actually, even if you cannot use it properly for all possible tasks, there are a lot of tasks where actually this is amenable. And just to give you a sense of tasks in which this approach can be used successfully, well, in literature and let's say as a benchmark, uh, typically uh, in reservoir computing, it's used um, this type of problems like the prediction of chaotic attractors. Okay, so Ecostat Networks had a lot of success in the prediction of chaotic time series um, in the in the let's say in the literature okay so this is a in the slide uh, it, it's the attractor of a famous biologically motivated dynamical system that is the Mackey glass system um, with the equation in the bottom right of the of the slide um, yeah this can sound a little bit abstract uh, though but i can tell you that in particular in my experience i have used these kind of algorithms so ECOSTAT networks and reservoir computing for a lot of practical problems, like for example, in distributed intelligence applications uh, and in a number of European projects, like in this case, it, it, the, pro the project was called uh, Rubicon. And the purpose was to create a distributed intelligence across, let's say, um, um, ecology of robotic uh, entities in the environment. So in, in, in essence, what we had in that kind of project was let's say the human that lives into a sensorized environment. Um, you can think about IoT applications, for example. Um, and uh, the point is that there are a number of sensors in this environment, like um, dozens and dozens of sensors. And the interaction between the human with the environment determines, let's say, uh, these streams of information that can be processed like time series data. Um, but you want to, let's say, solve problems like uh, human localization, robot localization, or let's say human activity uh, recognition, or let's say anticipating the user needs, etc. Uh, so you have you can have a number of computational tasks in which actually you can see that there is, uh, in a sense, um, this Markovian assumption that you can you can consider true, uh, because for example, if you consider um, robot localization, of course the sensors readings in, in the near past are more important to determine the location than the, um, than the sensor readings in the far past. Okay, so um, this is a good, this is a good uh, way in which you can apply, okay, um, a good scenarios for applications of Ecostat networks. All right, uh, and the point is that in these cases, what we did, it was uh, the cool part that we did is to implement these kind of algorithms into very tiny devices. So this was really one of the plus of these um, of these projects to embed the learning algorithms, fully trainable ecostat networks inside the sensors where the information was produced. Okay, so you can give real time monitoring of the user, for example, um, and also you can do real time uh, updating uh, of the weights uh, in the in the readout of the system. Uh, even if you have like four kilobytes of RAM in total. Okay, so this was the amount of memory that we could use. Um, yeah, and there are a number of experiments like robot localization, like I said, in the same framework or human activity recognition, um, but also clinical applications. And this is also important, I think, because the same approach can be used also to monitor the status, let's say the physical status of the human, um, for example, for clinical purposes, like um, instead of requiring the person to go to the hospital, let's say, where the clinician can test for, let's say, one hour, the, um, the person to understand, for example, the balance skills uh, after a surgery. Uh, in, instead, you can apply, let's say, a, a machine learning algorithm inside uh, a balance board, a Nintendo balance board, 
that based on the on the information on the pressure that that is uh, collected by the four sensors uh, on, in, on the corners of the balance board, then feeds a uh, reservoir computing neural network and in, in real time can tell you, let's say, an estimation of the clinical assessment. So the, the, the clinician, let's say, in a sense, can monitor every day in, in the user um, when the user is in its home. Okay, so uh, it, this is a, really a change of a shift of perspective. And nowadays, we are using this approach into this European project that is called teaching. In this case, we have applications in the area of cyber physical systems of systems, which means, let's say, the human in autonomous driving application and the human uh, factor, let's say, into avionics application. So you can have a look at our website for, for the uh, information about this and news about this project or get in touch with uh, Twitter or LinkedIn accounts. So just to give a, a sense of what we're doing in this project, um, for example, it's important to, to have the human feedback in, in autonomous vehicles applications. And to have the human feedback one way, for example, you have a system in which you want to modify and personalize the driving, uh, the driving mode of the, uh, or let's say the, the level of uh, automation in the driving um, assistance. Okay, so in order to do that appropriately, uh, to get the proper feedback from the human, what we want to do, what you want to do is to estimate the physiological, emotional and cognitive state of the human, okay? So this is what we call the human centric personalization, because based on the status of the human uh, identified automatically using uh, uh, the neural networks, then you can modify the parameters of the of the vehicle. OK, so you're not you don't need to ask continuously for feedback to the human. This is what we call human centered personalization. Um, so uh, in a sense, um, the cool part is that uh, actually, uh, you can develop your system in TensorFlow, let's say, but in, you can, let's say, if this is a long short term memory network, for example, um, on a lot of, let's say, Jets, for example, Jetson Nano or in a number of uh, devices, you cannot install the entire TensorFlow. You can, you can support TensorFlow Lite, for example, for doing the inference. But instead, if you, even in TensorFlow Lite, you can do all the computation that you need for implementing an ecosystem network. So you can do personalization on board. Okay, and this is cool. And this is nice to see that in practice, if you look at problems in the area of uh, human state monitoring, like the, the, the benchmark that I have reported here for stress recognition from um, physiological sensors, like this WESAD and uh, a certain data set, um, or human activity recognition like the other three data sets, then you can see that in practice you can have a performance with the ECOSTED network that is really in line, or let's say slightly below the one that you can have with long short term memory network or gated recurrent units or state of the art a neural network with complex architecture that you cannot uh, adapt online on the board. Okay, but instead the ECOSTED network you can. And um, the properties are good from the accuracy level that you can reach. And that's interesting, okay? So sometimes, for example, here, you can even have um, for the certain data set a, a higher performance than long short-term memory network. So it's even uh, uh, easier to train these kind of architectures, okay? But I'm coming to that in a moment. Um, and uh, there are a number of properties that we are uh, using in, in the teaching project. Um, <clears throat> the basic idea is that uh, you, ca you can have a cloud and on the cloud, you have a, a lot of data, let's say, uh, historical data, which you can do the training, for, uh, you, using which you can do the training, uh, for example, using the full potentiality of the entire TensorFlow uh, ecosystem, okay? And then what you can do is you can distribute the, the trained uh, neural networks to the clients, let's say to the vehicles, okay? And the vehicles can only run TensorFlow Lite, let's say. Okay, so a reduced version where you can typically you can you could also you can you could in principle do only the inference, but if you do simplified learning, you can also do optimization. Um, and then you what you can do is based on the local data on the uh, local driver, you can do personalization of the um, of the of the um, let's say of the uh, services that you are offering. Okay, like the the, um, the uh, autonomous driving level, and the intriguing feature is that if you use um, closed form solutions, then you can find that you can have uh, let's say optimal 
federation. And um, let's say you can aggregate optimally, in a sense, the uh, learned uh, information um, based on the local information. So in practice, the, the, the clients in the system can transfer par parts of the of the uh, of the uh, trained weights to the to the system to the to the to the to the cloud system, and then in the cloud, the optimal federation can be performed. This is really a, a step, um, a decisive step. Uh, towards, uh, let's say, a, a better federated system um, compared to typical approaches in which you do typically uh, you do the average over the weights that are that are provided by by the by the individual learners. But in this case, as we are dealing with, let's say, closed form solutions, mathematically you can find that it is possible to 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 have a, an optimal form of federation. Um, there is a paper that we have presented in in IGSNN this year that is called federated. Uh, Reservoir computing that uh, it describes exactly this approach. So you can you can have a look at that if you are interested in this aspect. Okay, and coming to the to the aspect of accuracy complexity trade-off, I would like to just mention this using uh, this slide, um, just to give the sense of, of what I mean by the uh, complexity accuracy trade-off with. Uh, EcoState network. So there are a number of data sets that you can find in, in the literature. So a benchmark data sets for time series classification here. I have just reported a few of those um, for a paper that I'm going to present in, in some months. Uh, it's called Reservoir Computing by Discretizing ODEs. But the point is that we have these reservoir computing approaches in the first two rows of every table. Okay, so one is the conventional EcoStack network. The other one is, let's say, a variant of that that is called Euler state network. Um, and then you have for comparison fully trainable architectures. Okay. Um, so one thing that you can uh, observe, the first thing is that you, that you can observe is that in the, let's say in the, um, in the umbrella mm, of uh, reservoir computing uh, approaches, you can have a similar accuracy compared to fully trainable architectures. Okay. So for example, here for the, the best uh, reservoir computing model, you have 95.6 percentage of accuracy compared to 97.9. Okay, so very similar uh, results, sometimes even better, okay? Like in this second table. But the point is that if you look at the number of trainable parameters, then you have, then you see that the number of trainable parameters for a reservoir computing system needed to reach this level of accuracy is a way lower okay one or even two order of magnitudes smaller than the, than the number of parameters that you need in fully trainable architectures this of course as you can see uh, translates also in um, shorter training times okay for example here you can see the model selection uh, time in minutes you can see hours compared to minutes or the training time for one single instance in, in let's say you, you have yeah, seconds compared to minutes okay and um, this is let's say a common a common um, a common things that you can see in general in when, when you apply a reservoir computing methods okay so similar accuracy to in most cases to 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 standard fully trainable architectures but a way less trainable parameters and a faster training Okay, so uh, I also would like to mention this nice piece of work by M Mantas Lukosevicius, that is a practical guide to applying ecostate networks. Uh, this is quite uh, old, but it's really uh, very good in, in, let's say, in uh, guiding a person into creating and, let's say, um, applying successfully uh, an ecostate network in practice. Okay. Now a, a few more, a few more information. Uh, let's say a few more topics. Okay, I, there is only more or less twenty minutes to the end of the of the tutorial, um, and there would be uh, let's say hundreds of, of of papers to describe. But let's say to keep the things short, uh, let's focus on a few things. Okay, only on a few topics that perhaps um, can be of interest. <clears throat> One of the um, most important things I believe in, in the practice of uh, reservoir computing is that, okay, we said that we can, uh, until now, I hope that I have convinced you that it is possible to um, do a way of learning. So use randomization instead of uh, learning in a number of, uh, in a number of cases for recurrent neural networks, okay? 
But the point is that, um, so I generate a, a random layer, a random recurrent layer. Um, if it is stable, it is amenable to be used like a recurrent layer for computation. Okay. But the point is that perhaps I can find uh, a better reservoir than just a random reservoir. Okay. So instead of having just a random reservoir, stable reservoir, I just would like perhaps to, to study the quality of the reservoir in order to optimize the quality of the reservoir and use a higher quality reservoir in my applications. Okay. All right. Um, in order to, to do so in literature, you can find a number of, let's say, ways of quantifying the uh, quality or the richness of the dynamics of my reservoir system. And um, I have indicated three of those um, that I think are the most uh, famous and more, let's say, commonly used in literature. The, the first one is the entropy of recurrent units activations. So potentially, one of the problems that you can have when you when you cr create a random reservoir is that actually um, all the all the activations of all the units are coupled. Okay. And so if you look at the manifold in which the state uh, progresses over time, in practice, this is much smaller dimensional than the, uh, than the uh, full reservoir, okay? <clears throat> so it, it's interesting to, to, let's say, to exploit and to, let's say, to, to have um, an entropy of the recurrent units activation that is as large as possible, okay? Um, another possibility is to study the short-term memory capacity of the system. Okay, so by this I mean uh, study the, um, the ability of the system to recall um, delayed versions of uh, the input. Okay, so uh, I can, let's say, train my reservoir computing system in order to recall progressively delayed versions of the input, uh, and, I, and, I can, <clears throat> and I can quantify the, um, let's say, the correlation between the um, predicted and the actual uh, value of the time series uh, with the delay, okay? This is called the memory capacity. Um, and uh, finally, uh, another interesting thing to see is the, or to mention is the edge of stability or the edge of chaos, okay? So in practice, uh, I said that the reservoir is a dynamical system and the dynamical system can have a number of regimes. Um, for example, it can be stable, it can be unstable, it can be chaotic. One particularly interesting regime of my dynamical system is the one in which the system is close to the boundary between the um, stability and instability behavior. That regime is called edge of stability or sometimes perhaps improperly edge of chaos. Uh, and it's interesting because uh, let's say it, it has been studied in, in several, uh, in several um, works, uh, that specific region uh, optimizes the performance of a recurrent neural network, okay? Um, all right, so in relation to these three, three aspects, uh, there are works in the literature that try to, to, to optimize one of these three, um, let's say, three, three qualities. For example, intrinsic plasticity is a very popular algorithm for training in an unsupervised fashion. Uh, and in an online fashion, the, um, the weights in the um, recurrent layer in order to, uh, um, let's say, to um, tune the probability density of the reservoir to the maximum entropy, okay? So now we want to optimize entropy. We adapt uh, parameters of the, of the transformation of the, let's say, nonlinearity of the neurons, uh, let's say the gain A and the bias B, in order to, let's say, minimize the KL divergence with respect to the maximum entropy distribution, okay? And for example, for hyperbolic tangent nonlinearities, then the maximum entr entropy distribution is the Gaussian distribution. And then in practice, you can find very simple, very simply uh, by minimizing that uh, KL divergence, you can, you can find uh, learning rules, okay? So you apply learning rules and in practice, you end up with let's say better reservoirs, okay? Reservoirs where the, the um, information in the, in the neurons, uh, let's say in a sense is um, improved from the perspective of the entropy. Um, the other aspect related to the edge of chaos um, is also interesting. And in order to improve, let's say the, the, the performance, uh, typically what, what we can do is the following. We can measure the local Lyapunov exponents 
of the reservoir system. And we can see actually, uh, like indicated in this uh, quite famous paper by Bodecker and uh, collaborators, um, this lambda here is the maximum local Lyapunov exponent that is, let's say, um, smaller than zero for uh, stable systems, above zero for, a chaos, for, let's say, unstable systems, and is, let's say, near zero, it means critical behavior. So it means, let's say, um, edge of stability, okay? So in, in several works, what has been observed is that, for example, if you measure the memory capacity, so the capacity to recall the delayed versions of the input, then you can see that this has a peak in correspondence of the transition between the st stability and instability of the reservoir system. So edge of chaos is intriguing. Um, and also another aspect that is intriguing um, is let's say the uh, the way in which I can shape the connectivity between the reservoir connections in order to maximize performance. Mm -hmm. So um, one thing that has been studied in the literature is that uh, orthogonal recurrent neural networks um, have uh, improved performances. Okay, so higher memory capacity, for example. Okay, one way to uh, to create um, a reservoir system that uh, has this orthogonal structure is by modifying appropriately the architecture of the reservoir. Okay, uh, for example, this uh, this architecture has been uh, uh, proposed in a famous paper by Rodar, uh, Rodan and, and Tino, uh, and is called the simple cycle reservoir. So, in the simple cycle reservoir, you can see that there is a lot of sparsity in the connection between. The neurons in the reservoir, so the, the neurons are re really uh, sparsely connected, but this sparsity is not random, is uh, let's say deterministic, and in let's say is used to create a cycle between the neurons in the reservoir. Okay, this uh, cycle in practice means that every neuron propagates its output to the next one in the cycle and receives input, let's say, from the previous one in the cycle. Um, in practice, if you look at the recurrent weight matrix that is induced by this topology, then we see that this is in practice, uh, um, let's say, an orthogonal structure, because let's say it's a, it's a very specific permutation matrix, um, where we have non-zero values only on the sub-diagonal and on the top right element. Okay, so in practice, this means that uh, with a very simple modification in the topology of the reservoir, now I have a computational property. It is, let's say, a computation based on orthogonal matrices. And this, let's say, on the one end is a simplification uh, because the system is, let's say, more simple to create. And instead of having, let's say, a squared number of, let's say, um, of uh, free, uh, freedoms, let's say, dimensions in which uh, I can tune all, all of these numbers in my randomization procedure, now I just need to, to tune one single number, okay? So this value, the, uh, W uh, hat, okay? Um, and even, even more, uh, what, what we proposed in a, in a, in a paper that we have pr presented in, in this conference, I just said, and this year, you can uh, start from this architecture and what you can do, you can, let's say, do something similar with respect to intrinsic plasticity. You can adapt the gain and the bias of the nonlinearity in order to, let's say, um, in order to drive the um, maximum local Lyapunov exponent to zero. Okay, so in order to go in this condition here, okay, where the computational properties of the system are maximized. So this is cool because I think because um, it, it the possibility of computing the lo the, the local Lyapunov exponent and using this local Lyapunov exponent, like let's say an error function to minimize with stochastic gradient descent, is just given by the fact that we are using this ring structure. Without the ring structure, it could be really perhaps impossible to find out an analytical form. Um, the, the 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 computation of the let's say at least a efficiently the computation of the local Lyapunov exponent, but in this case it, it becomes possible and maximizes uh, the performance of the of the ECOSTAT network. So in this case the algorithm is called PTA and let's say uh, improves the performance of both ECOSTAT networks and simple cycle reservoirs. Okay, a few more topics about reservoir computing before to leave. 
Uh, one thing is about approximation capabilities. Here again, there is a long story that is really um, made short in this slide. There are a number of works uh, by stranded works by uh, these guys, um, Lyudmila Grigorieva, Juan Pablo Ortega, and uh, Lukas Gonon, uh, that are doing a, a lot of uh, using a lot of effort in order to study um, the mathematics of reservoir computing. And they came out with a number of approximation theorems on echo state networks. And from the practical perspective, I try to, to summarize this into this slide. Um, so the, the most important thing is that echo state networks can approximate any fading memory filter. So this is a, a, an important result. Um, by echo state network, I mean nonlinear re reservoir plus linear without. Um, but the cool, the cool aspect of the theory is that actually they prove that even if I use a linear reservoir system, so even more simple, okay, um, provided that my readout is instead nonlinear, then I can have again this uh, universal approximation property. Okay, so uh, this is important also under, I mean, under several perspectives, but also under the perspective of a physical reservoir computing. Where sometimes, for example, in photonics, nonlinearities are more difficult to be implemented. But in general, th this other aspect of physical reservoir computing is, is intriguing. Um, and is a huge part of the community of reservoir computing. Um, so the basic idea is that, uh, like I said previously, we have uh, our dynamical system that is the reservoir, and then we have the trainable part of the, of the architecture, which is the readout. Okay. So the reservoir is the input-driven dynamical system that creates the representation of the of the input time series. Um, but in practice, it's a dynamical system that is not trainable, typically. Okay. Um, so in practice, the idea is the following. I can replace my software that does this, let's say, simulation by a physical system that computes exactly the same thing. So a dynamical system uh, that is input driven. So based on the input, it reacts uh, somehow, but in a stable fashion. Okay, so there are a number of physical substrates that can be used here, and you can have a sense of, of all of these works in this very nice survey paper published on neural networks uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, for example, you can have a photonic system here. Um, you can have a memory step system. You can have, let's say, even a magnetic system, or let's say, uh, let's say, um, and a number of other systems like biological system, et cetera, okay? So a physical system that that implements these dynamical properties of the reservoir um, and that reacts to the input in a stable fashion. Okay. Um, a really few more, more topics uh, before to go. One, one thing that I would like at least to mention is the deep reservoir computing. Okay, so depth into recurrent neural network can be injected into several fashion because the, the most, let's say, important aspect to, to, to see in this, in this respect is that uh, even if when we unfold our recurrent neural network architecture, um, over time we have a deep neural network like we have seen in the beginning of the tutorial, um, actually the transitions between um, the transformations between the entities, the mathematical entities are shallow. Like we have a shallow input to uh, hidden transformation, shallow hidden to hidden, shallow hidden to output transformations, typically in recurrent neural networks architectures. And you can make uh, an, a recurrent neural network deeper by making deep, for example, the input transformation or making deep the readout transformation or and looking at the case of reservoir computing by making deep the reservoir transformation, okay? Um, so we introduced, uh, we introduced a, a few years ago, this model that is called the deep echo state network model uh, in, in which in practice we have not just a recurrent hidden layer that is uh, fixed after initialization, but a pipeline of recurrent, uh, untrained recurrent hidden layer and untrained reservoir layers. Okay, so the, the crucial difference is that now <clears throat> we have that the input is driven, is driven the dynamics of the first reservoir, and then the dynamics of the first reservoir drive the uh, dynamics of the second reservoir, and so on until the, the, 
the last layer of the architecture. Okay, so the point is that, um, let's say again, long story short, the, the point is that um, the different la layers in the reservoir architecture, what they do, uh, they develop qualitatively different dynamics, even if they are, um, even, even if without learning. Okay, so just the fact that you are, st you, that you are sticking, um, let's say, uh, untrained dynamical system one on top of the other gives the system a number of computational properties that are investigated starting from this paper on neural computing. <clears throat> so for free, in a sense, even without learning, but just stacking perhaps the same number of units into a, a, a hierarchical architecture, you can have qualitatively different dynamics. And by this, I mean, for example, uh, multiple time scales, multiple frequency, etc. Okay, and if you have a, a problem in which you know that you want to, um, that you might need, let's say, in a sense, to um, to deal with multiple uh, multiple uh, frequencies, for example, then you can give all of these um, all of these states to your readout, and your readout does the learning, so modulates the importance of all of the frequencies uh, for uh, creating the output. Or we have also studied cases in which perhaps you only want to do this stacking trick in order to improve the richness of the uh, reservoir dynamics. Okay, so similarly to what we have seen previously for the quality metrics of uh, the, the richness of the, of the reservoir, <clears throat> what we have found is that it is possible to improve that richness so for example, the entropy, or for example, the uh, proximity to the edge of stability by just uh, doing this very simple trick of stacking multiple layers, okay? Um, and from a mathematical perspective, this deep ecosystem networks can be seen like a set uh, of nested dynamical system, uh, systems, um, input-driven dynamical system, where in practice, the external time series uh, XT in this equation drives the dynamics of the first layer, H1T, and the dynamics of H1T uh, in, uh, drive the dynamics of the second layer H2T, okay? So et cetera, um, until we reach the last uh, layer L in this case, okay? And the cool thing is that in practice, this structure that is given to the uh, recurrent uh, architecture, so this deep uh, uh, organization, hierarchical organization is reflected both in the temporal representations that are developed and into the mathematical entities involved in the analysis, like for example, the Jacobians. Okay, so now really going very briefly into that, uh, this is a representation of the multiple time scales. Uh, in practice, um, the reaction to input perturbation uh, is different in the different layers of the, of the deep ecosystem networks, irrespectively of the fact that you are not applying any learning. Okay, so we were inspired by this paper on NeurIPS, um, in which they showed that by using very, a very specific and very peculiar ad hoc training to the recurrent hidden dynamics, then you can find multiple time scales. But actually, we found conditions of, of stability of the reservoir system under which you can have the same property even without learning. So, again, this is a, a way in which you can exploit in a sense, the uh, properties of the, of the neural networks architectures may be wisely in order to, to save computational time, okay? And there are a number of other studies, uh, but I would like to just at least mention um, my uh, repository on GitHub, where if you want, you can give a chance, uh, even if in, in your experiments, in your projects to, um, to uh, reservoir computing and deep reservoir computing. The code is in Keras, and it's very simple. As you can see, it fits even in one slide. Um, so if you want, have a look at the code and use it freely just with the, with the reference to the, to the paper. Um, okay, uh, very one very last bit of information is related to the, um, to the possibility of extending what I mentioned until now so computation through stable dynamical systems, even if untrained, to from the time series cases to the graph cases. Okay, so now differently from from before, instead of having a time series in input, we have a graph in input. And what we let's say what we want to do in practice is um, we want to, for example, to solve a problem of uh, chemical uh, compound uh, prediction of toxicity. Okay, so we have a chemical 
a molecule here that is represented by a graph. So we give this graph representation to our neural network model, machine learning model. What we want to have in output is a classification of the molecule. So for example, if it is bad for the human health or it's okay for the human health, okay? Um, so the, the very elementary, um, at least mental uh, trick to consider here is to, to replace in our mind the concept of time step with the concept of a vertex in the graph. So now instead of computing information at every time step, we compute information for every vertex. Um, and the concept of the previous time step now is replaced by the concept of neighborhood of a vertex. Okay, so in practice, what we do consider, let's say this graph in the figure and consider, for example, this specific vertex V, what we do, we compute a state or an embedding, so-called embedding for this vertex V. That is a function of the input features, for example, the type of atom uh, that this vertex is representing um, and uh, of the embeddings of the neighbors. So this is like uh, the state of the previous time step. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, so in practice, if you if you consider these equations and you collect all these equations um, for every vertex in the graph, then you end up with this kind of um, equation. Okay, so this is a, 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 a recurrency equation uh, because in practice you have this H that is the collective representation of the state that appears both on the left hand side and on the right hand side. Um, you have this X that is the input features matrix. You have this W and WR that are the uh, two uh, parameter weight matrices. And you have this A tilde that is the uh, normalized uh, adjacency matrix. Okay, that encodes the structure of the, uh, of the graph. So in practice, the, the basic idea is again the same. So I have a system um, and I want to use the same idea as before of the reservoir. I want to uh, encode uh, the input graph as the fixed point of this dynamical system, okay? So in order to ensure that this dynamical system, let's say, um, um, as a, a, a well-formed solution, so at least a, a, as a solution, and this solution is unique, I can impose, for example, a stability condition uh, to this dynamical system. So I can impose what we called a uh, graph embedding stability property which nicely becomes something very similar to what we have seen in, in the beginning uh, regarding reservoir computing. You just need to, score, to scale the eigenvalues of these recurrent weight matrix, WR. But now it's operating on the graph. And so in practice, what you do, you start from this equation, you, you transform the equation into an, into an iterative equation, and uh, then you're done, okay? So you don't need to do any kind of learning, even if this is in practice a deep learning approach for graphs. You just initialize your reservoir for graph layer randomly under the graph embedding stability condition. And then for every graph in the data set, you initial, initialize the initial condition, and then you iterate the equation until convergence, and that's done. Okay, so the details are rep reported in this 2020 um, AAAI paper um, by me and my colleague uh, Alessio Micheli. Okay, so um, long story short, again, also in this case, we have the first layer that we drive to convergence. And then this, uh, let's say, fixed point becomes the input for the second layer. And then you drive the second layer until convergence. The, then the fixed point of the second layer becomes the, let's say, the driving input. So the, the, the input features graphs for uh, um, graph for the, for the second, for the third layer, and so on and so forth until you reach the last layer. Okay. Um, that you drive to convergence also the last layer, and then you consider all of these, let's say, fixed points, you concatenate them, and you use this as the input for the readout layer, okay? As easy as this. And you can see that in practice, you can achieve state-of-the-art performance or even outperform the state-of-the-art results of much more complicated um, algorithms uh, for graphs on, and on a number of benchmark data sets for graph classification. Okay, but the cool thing is also that in practice, when you have these algorithms is indicated by these uh, fast and deep graph neural network lines, uh, you, you can have a very small number of trainable parameters, like I mentioned at the beginning. So in this case, for example, uh, like hundreds of trainable parameters compared to um, hundreds of thousands of trainable parameters. Okay, and this, of course, um, ends up 
into a very uh, short training time. Okay, so efficiency of training times, it's a, a huge plus of this algorithm. So for example, a split second uh, compared to um, several minutes, okay, of computation with state-of-the-art um, algorithms. Okay, time to conclude for the tutorial. Um, so in summary, um, we have seen reservoir computing like a paradigm for designing and training recurrent neural networks. Um, this is based on a fixed hidden recurrent layer uh, that you generate randomly, but control for asymptotic stability, for example, using echo state property in this case. Uh, and you uh, apply on top of that a trainable readout layer. Um, there are a number of interesting properties like the fact that these systems are fast and simple to be trained compared to standard recurrent neural networks and of course also to long short term memories uh, and networks and, and gated recurrent units. So the, the, the best, uh, let's say the best plus that you have is efficiency. So this system is much more efficient compared to other, to other uh, alternatives. And the, um, this uh, research area is very active, for example, on the, on the side of embedded applications, on the side of um, implementations into neuromorphic hardware, in, 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 and also in the direction of extending the approach to more complicated forms of data like graphs. OK, I would just like to, to conclude with um, a mention on, uh, on the two task forces uh, that are related to this work that I have presented. One is the task force on randomization based neural networks and learning systems. And the other one is the IEEE task force on reservoir computing. Okay, finally, um, uh, a promotion, okay, for, um, for a workshop that is going to, um, to, uh, to happen today. Okay, and the, the time of the conference is 12.10. Uh, 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 PM. So uh, yeah, it, it's like in the European time zone is um, 1 PM. Um, the deep learning, the, 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 the workshop is entitled Deep Learning in Unconventional Neuromorphic um, Hardware and is uh, organized by me and by other colleagues uh, from different universities in, uh, in Europe. Okay, so but the basic idea is that we try to um, put together the two communities of deep learning and let's say uh, physicists that try to create new neuromorphic hardware supports uh, to run the deep learning algorithms. And reservoir computing, of course, plays a, a central role in that. Um, all right, so uh, I think it's time to, to conclude and to um, thank you a lot for your attention. Perhaps I hope uh, you can be interested also in the workshop. You have you, you have here the, the, the Zoom link that can be uh, that can be assessed for free, um, and with this, of course, I thank you for for attending and for uh, watching this tutorial. Uh, don't hesitate if you um, want to get in touch to to to, to write me a couple of lines uh, at my email or to get in touch on LinkedIn or Twitter. I'm really super open to collaborations um, at every level. So thanks a lot. And if you have uh, any any question, or perhaps I am a bit late, but if you want to engage a discussion, I, I am available um, both now and, uh, of course, also uh, later on. Claudio, it looks like we have one question in the chat about the deep echo state. Okay. Um, I see a question by uh, Dr. Nabil uh, Mashred. Uh, he, he asks uh, about the computational complexity uh, of, echo, of deep echo state networks. Um, all right. Um, well, uh, I, I can tell you. Okay, the question is um, that they seems to be computationally very heavy, uh, and how long it takes to perform a simple task. Well, actually, uh, that's not the case. Um, deep echo state networks are actually not computationally heavy. What we did, what we, what we, what you can do actually in practice is instead of having one single layer, a, a huge layer, a big layer, uh, you just split the same units into multiple layers. Okay, um, and using this, um, you actually are not uh, making the computation more, more complex. Instead, you are sparsifying even more the architecture. Okay, so it turns out if you go and and, and have a look, for example, at the papers, you, it turns out that the computation, let's say, cost of running a deep echo state network is uh, smaller than the computational cost 
of running a, a single layer uh, ecostat network with the same number of units. Okay, and to give you a sense of the um, comparison with state of the art for current neural networks, um, of course, uh, yeah, you can you can have a look at the at the at the, um, at the references that I mentioned, for example, here in this chapter. Um, one thing that uh, is apparent is that if you compare the training times of deep ecostat networks or even ecostat networks, of course, uh, with respect to uh, with respect to long short term memory uh, or gated recurrent units or even Vanilla recurrent neural networks that you can see, then you can see, uh, let's say, uh, at least one order of magnitude of training times uh, less. Okay, um, typically with deep ecostat networks. Uh, you reduce the gap with uh, with respect to uh, gated recurrent units or long short term memory networks, um, but you 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 improve in efficiency. Okay, I hope that this more or less um, gives the sense of the of the comparison. Um, but okay, thanks a lot for for the for the for the comment. All right, um, so I think the, the tutorial has been recorded, so perhaps it will be made available also uh, offline. Um, and I would just like to, uh, to, to, to thank you again. If you don't have any further question, uh, I am in any case available, so you can uh, drop me a line in my email or you can even contact me using the application of the, of the conference. It has been a pleasure for me to, to be here with you today and perhaps let's see um, together again in a couple of hours at the, at the workshop. Thanks a lot and have a nice day and then a continuation of the, of the conference. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Bye-bye.